next session we have a chairperson uh, dr deepak dalal sir uh, sir is a trustee and honorary diabetes specialist unl diabetic foundation consulting diabetes specialist and endocrinologist sir is a above all a wonderful wonderful mentor and a great human being uh, the second chairperson is my friend dr ss daria from jaipur he is mbbs md diploma diabetes and consultant physician and diabetologist so i would like to uh, tell dr deepak dalal sir to start the new session deepak sir sir you are on mute sir deepak sir good morning everybody good morning sir i welcome dr parthakar i have met him personally on a number of occasions and he is a one of the great torch bearer of type 1 diabetes not only in uk but internationally if i read his uh, cv he won't be able to give the lecture but i will like to say that he is one of the finest human being leading with the care of type 1 children with a diabetes and that too in the capacity of meeting the politicians and helping dr parthagar welcome for your presentation thank you thank you thank you very much everybody as ever a pleasure um so what i'll do i'll start by sharing my screen which is the most important thing uh and then let's see do it hopefully you can see my screen yes sir yes sir. so i've been asked to talk about levels of care of type 1 mm -hmm. diabetes in children and adults so i'll go through some of the principles of what i think is something that's happening uh, as ever thank you for the kind introduction thank you to banchi for organizing this and hopefully in the future we'll be able to get to less virtual more face to face which is always more desirable from that point of view so to start off with i've always said this if you do type 1 diabetes or even type 2 diabetes these are the three things that things sit on self management peer support and access to professionals and i think the problem is that we always focus on number 3 which is trained professionals the problem that we have is we don't have enough professionals um, whatever we do how much can you train how much how many diabetologists are coming through how many diabetologists are aware of the new change so that's always a challenge trying to get there so with that in mind if you talk about self management the big things that we're looking at what things can make your life better that's what we're trying to do if you're living with diabetes most of the time on your own without access to a professional because of present times difficult to find doctors to talk to then you're looking at the uh, presence of technology you're looking at the presence of education you're looking at the presence of any sort of mental health support and i'll talk about peer support a little bit separately but in general what you're trying to do with technology whether it's uh, whether it's libra whether it's cgm whatever depending on affordability but then again not everybody can afford it then the most important thing that you have that you have got blood sugar numbers to look at you got things that you can do and i think it's quite important that you have access to those if you can afford it because in obviously the india setting it's not as easy to say that everybody should have x and y but the big thing is obviously education so what do you do with your diabetes when you're struggling with this when you've gone out on holiday that sort of stuff so i think if you think about the care level then the important thing is having technology support having education which is a very important thing now what is peer support peer support is something that is actually in its infancy stage even in the uk setting but we are trying to get it more formalized and this is something which we don't use enough in india you've got groups uh, such as you have blue circle you've got diabetes all these groups of people that are trying to do peer support and it's quite important that we try and encourage them more because what they can do is they can fill in the gap for a lot of doctors who are struggling to sort of cope up with patients because there's an essence of the lived experience the important bit bit is you know what are the expert patients what support can they give to parents parents are most switched on what support can they give to other fellow parents mm -hmm. so having that is quite important in your care level so not only is it about your own as a doctor your own professionalism your own education the other important bit is what can you do to help make our lives better as clinicians mm -hmm. and having support 
for uh, peer support through peer support where they encourage them to talk to each other they encourage them. so you can guide these peer support groups with education give them the right tools so they can cascade your bit they become your vehicle to pass it on whether it's formal whether it's informal whichever way it is now you got obviously got two levels of care one is the primary care level or the gp level and the second one is what we call the specialist level so let's talk about what is the primary care or the gp level so what do you have what do you need in primary care level so people first of all you need the basics you have got type 1 diabetes in children and adolescents so whatever happens you don't want them to direct them towards uh try this food try that food so that uh, you know they end up trying to come off insulin and cause more harm that's the last thing you want you want to know be aware that insulin use is the most important thing in their management you want them to be aware that uh, technology is there but important thing also is about the need for referral where does a general practitioner or a primary care say this is the limit of my knowledge and i think that's the most important thing that we try and do with our local general practitioners basics you should know in the sense that they need insulin for life you need to get them some education you need to make them aware of technology if they can afford it. but the most important thing is knowing your limits and thereby saying this is all i can do with type 1 i may be better trained in type 2 type 1 is very different and this is where we need to do the referral so what about specialist care in specialist care we've got a different setting specialist care obviously specialists can afford uh, or offer more of the technology they can talk about closed loop they can talk about connected pen they can talk about faster or more modern insulin again a lot of that is tied in with the affordability and what people can and cannot do but the education they can offer is also much of a higher basis so what you're having in this place is suddenly you're turning around and saying these are the two levels basic level basic education basic knowledge of insulin being the important thing and after that you know when to refer it over to specialists for higher technology higher health etc so one of the things that we always talk about is in any setting any level of care the important thing obviously is communication and because that's the important fundamental where you want to make sure that that sort of communication is taking place whether you are in primary care whether you are in specialist care you need to have the ability to communicate so that you can pass on the right knowledge what you also have is these things in children and adolescents right you have the hormonal challenges there's an age group where they're more rebellious by nature you have peer pressure other people and then school and college life is an important part of them growing up and how do they identify with having type 1 diabetes is there stigma with it the fact that they have to inject what about family structure is it supportive does they understand or do you have the same issues that oh you're taking injections so it might affect you or you know how you live how you get married in life all of that so these are all the nuances that children and adolescents face going up with which is very difficult for them as well when they're growing up so what you do have is you have this document called language matters and in the indian setting you've got a type 1 document and a type 2 document both of them exist on this website which was built by patient groups the type 1 uh, with uh, diabetes and the type 2 document being built by dr tejal lakia and our colleagues so there's some really good uh, pieces of work there which is done in the indian setting to look at what language nuances might help what things would you would say that would come across in the right way or not so these are all important levels of care as you go along and i think that's important part so whichever so if you take a step back when we talk about levels of care what are we trying to do we are trying to say that a whenever the person with type 1 diabetes presents wherever they present if it's with a general practitioner or the basic you know primary care you need to have that knowledge so you're aware when to refer on don't send them to do something that might cause you harm and you want to try some particular product or particular powders or whatever or yoga or whatever that's the important thing safety once you come to the specialist team the specialist team role then is to educate the primary care colleague and the specialist care then what do they do is then they can offer the higher technology higher education higher support going forward so that's pretty much the principle of what you want to do so type 1 diabetes is as complicated as you want to obviously the nuances are of age because you know we have all been teenagers we all and those of you who got teenagers at home will understand you got plenty of pressures in life nowadays being 17 in the 1980s and 90s and being 17 in 2022 is very different social media puts lots of pressure what does type 1 diabetes look like etc so these are all important considerations to have as we give them the treatment and the approach that we do and finally 
It's about communication. It's about knowing how to interact with them. So I think if you have those principles and the levels of care, I think type 1 diabetes care can be done much better than what we do around the globe at the moment. So I'll leave it there. And uh, thank you. Thank you for asking as ever. Deepak so, sir. Hello. Hello. Deepak sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I, I cannot hear anything. Can you hear me now? Yes, now, now we can hear you. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. Go for it. No, so I've just finished. So you let me know. Um, yes. um, I, I think, as I said, quite straightforward presentation. So thank you to everybody for asking. So very early in the morning here. It's about to go to work. So uh, no, thank you. Thank you for your time. And uh, if any questions, let me know. Otherwise, that's ever a pleasure to join in. It is wonderful, sir, to listen to you. Uh, sir. Deepak, sir, let's move to the next talk. Sir. Arthakar. Again, mm. you know, it was excellent, I will say. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you as ever. All right. Take care, guys. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice. Okay. So, Dr. Chowda, uh, we have another chairperson or I go ahead? Please, sir. Uh, you, you continue, sir, to introduce Dr. Thomas. Right. Dr. Thomas Den, very good friend of ours, not say mine, ours. And uh, I know him as a sweet person who has introduced sweet registry and not introduced, but executed sweet registry in India. And I request him to go ahead with the presentation because I do not believe in reading the long series, but we come straight to the point, sir. <clears throat> Thomas, then please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, Team RX, do we have his presentation? Hello. Hello, my name is Thomas Dunnan. I'm the chairman of the Sweet Project, and I'm a pediatric diabetologist from Hanover, Germany. The subject of my talk is to let you know about trends in pediatric diabetes, an update from the worldwide Sweet Registry. Let me first uh, say a big thank you to the uh, corporate members of the Sweet Project, which uh, are Abbott, Beringer, Dexcom, Insulate, Lilly, Medtronic, Sanofi, uh, who are supporting us. And in particular, also the team behind the Sweet Project, which are uh, the people doing their data analysis, Reinhard Holz, Stephanie Lansinger, Sasha Titel, and uh, the people who are organizing everything, Katharina Klee, Tanya von Loh, and Michael Witsch. Now, um, if we take a look at the differences between international registries, you can see that a registry alone and just benchmarking uh, does not necessarily improve the glycemic control or outcomes in children with diabetes. So you see that although the uh, age difference in the glycemic control is pretty similar between the countries, the, the sheer level of A1C is uh, quite different. Now, we started to say, okay, we might, it might be necessary to compare not only within countries, but also between countries uh, in terms of a benchmarking with a vision that what we want to reach is equal high quality care for children with diabetes and to harmonize the outcomes on the basis of real data. And this was how the SWEET project was started. Now you can see that it is now really a worldwide uh, enterprise. Uh, the blue dots are the ones that have joined us even within the COVID uh, pandemic. And you can see there are several centers in India, and we're very proud uh, that India is so well represented here. 
but the majority of the centers are indeed uh, in Europe right now, but you can see we have a lot of cent centers all over the world. Now, if we look at the database, there are 120 centers uh, with roughly 100,000 patients overall. Uh, in the COVID year of 2021, we had uh, close to 50,000 uh, patients entered into the data. And uh, so this allows us really to analyze uh, more than 1 million uh, visits of, of patients uh, over the time. If you see here, uh, if we compare 22 centers, which were uh, actually initially already part of uh, our diabetes registry in 2008 and 10, and this is the blue line, uh, there was also this, this typical uh, relationship between age and glycemic control with the levels increasing in the adolescent uh, age group. But you can see in the green curve how this has improved in all age groups over the past 10 years. And for reference, I'm showing you the data of the type 1 diabetes exchange, which was uh, analyzed more or less in the same uh, time period. And you can see that although this reg registry also was looking very much into um, looking at data over time, uh, there, there is quite a big difference. So what can we know what really makes such a big difference? And here you see the temporal development of three things. The percentage of patients that are achieving an HbA1c of less than 7%, less than 53 millimoles per mole, the percentage of patients who are on uh, insulin pump therapy and the percentage of patients who are using a uh, continuous glucose monitor, CGM. What uh, is quite apparent is that already from early on, from 2008, the use of diabetes technology as uh, insulin pump therapy is increasing. But it takes some time that you also see that the um, glycemic control is also improving, that the percentage reaching this target of an A1C below 7% is increasing. So there is kind of a learning curve also with new technology and the improvement in A1C is not happening immediately. If you may, you already see another uh, upward trend in the uh, A1C and this also again is preceded by an increase in diabetes technology, in this case with CGM. And it will be very interesting to see now that automated insulin delivery, the combination of pumps and sensors for automated insulin delivery, uh, how this again will have a further impact. Now, how do we do all this discussion? So uh, we uh, are able, first of all, to really compare. So here you can see spider, uh, um, displays of uh, the percentage of patients which are in good control with retinopathy, with uh, severe hypoglycemia, with acute complications or high lipids and things like that. And it uh, shows you uh, that there are two ways to compare. Of course, first of all, you want to compare how is your center doing uh, where compared to others? Is it uh, in certain areas better or worse than others? And then also, uh, to take your own center as a, as a control. Of, you, of course, you want to improve uh, uh, and, and you want to have uh, more uh, patients in good control and uh, less complications. So, so this gives you an oversight of, uh, of how you're doing. Another way is, of course, to look at size. You want to learn from centers of uh, uh, similar size. So this is a bubble blot, and a bigger bubble shows you a higher number of uh, overall patients. And then you can see, on the one hand, the patients, uh, the percentage of patients in uh, with a high A1C, and then compare it uh, to uh, patients with a near to target A1C. And obviously, you want to be as far as possible on the low. Uh, right corner. And so you can actually use such a uh, bubble blot to uh, look at a center which is of si similar size, but is currently doing uh, much better than you. Now, another important thing for the success of the suite registry is peer review. 
so that not only you are uh, comparing your data, but you're also visited by uh, your peers and discussing it. And it's really a learning process, both of uh, your own center as well as uh, the, the visited center. So because there is an exchange and uh, so both sites are actually learning from each other in this way. Uh, and uh, the, the end point is if you pass this test, you are a collaborative center or even a center of reference. Unstable. Now, uh, obviously, as Sweet is growing, we have now created hubs uh, to organize the international efforts a little bit uh, more. So we have now five different hubs with different hub leaders uh, who are taking care uh, of all uh, the, 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 the local issues and uh, obviously translate them to a chair in healthcare uh, delivery and healthcare policy. What we uh, are using as well is, as this is now making it very difficult to conduct real in-person clinical uh, visits, we are now uh, just starting a process of um, using virtual peer review uh, visits, uh, which allows, for example, centers from Germany and Slovenia visiting a center in Canada. And uh, no ocean is actually in between and it works really very well because you can uh, discuss things you can even virtually look at uh, uh, certain facilities and advise uh, so um, this is uh, something that also works very well and a new trend well talking about trends it's also important to see what the COVID pandemic has done and and obviously the COVID pandemic had hit, has hit us in, in different uh, time periods uh, differently. And uh, here you can see that we have distributed the different suite centers according to the disease burden uh, with COVID from the first wave. Uh, so uh, you do see uh, India there uh, in the beginning uh, being in a, in a quarter with a very low COVID mortality from the first um, for the first wave, while other countries like Belgium, Chile, England, France, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, and USA were, had a very high uh, background COVID mortality. So interestingly, the average glycemic control in all centers remained pretty much the same, even uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. But in those with the highest quartile of background mortality in their population, you can see a immediate increase in uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, um, if you compare uh, the year before COVID and after. But interestingly, just prior to the second wave, so in, uh, uh, in August, September of uh, 2020, the uh, DKA rates uh, returned back uh, into the normal range. So really those systems were able to um, adjust very uh, quickly and it, it was uh, just an immediate effect of the lockdown and the disruption of medical services, which only happened in those countries where uh, COVID was a particularly big problem. If we look at uh, other things like the acute complication of a hypoglycemia, there wasn't really an impact uh, of, of COVID. And uh, there was also, of course, the question whether, for example, uh, the daily insulin dose would increase because uh, people would be less uh, exercising and so on. And yes, you do see a little bit of an increase in the insulin dose in those two quarters with the countries with the highest uh, uh, problem of um, uh, COVID-19, which is uh, quarter three and quarter four. You see there's a significant increase in the insulin dose, but again, it is returned uh, immediately uh, to the... Um, the other, the, the normal pre-pandemic values uh, after the first wave was over prior to the second wave. Now, if we look at diabetes technology, uh, another interesting trend is, while insulin pump use more or less uh, stayed uh, quite the same, so there was no influence on the insulin pump use, you can see that in virtually every country uh, and every quartile of COVID uh, mortality, there was a huge increase in the CGM use because people understood that the virtual diabetes care uh, only really works when you are using CGM and then maybe have cloud-based uh, consultations uh, to really exchange uh, our information 
uh, from from one uh, center to another. So uh, clearly, the trend here is that due to COVID, the CGM use really increased quite a lot. Now, if we have so much CGM and we don't have uh, HbA1c, the blood-based A1c, as much as we had it before, how can such a registry respond to that? Well, we created a so-called combined glucose indicator, which is using for the uh, comparison of glycemic control both the HbA1c me measurements based on the standardized uh, A1c determination, the A1c estimation from time and range based on the CGM profiles for those centers who are able to upload the complete CGM profiles, and also to use um, the um, if, if just the parameters, for example, the percentage time and range, the percentage time below range is entered into the database, then uh, this is also used for A1c calculation. And then this is called this, uh, uh, the continuous uh, combined glucose indicator. And you can see here that it can be nicely used to actually compare uh, glycemic control with this aggregated data uh, over time. And as you see, the um, percentage of patients in good control is actually increasing uh, during the um, pandemic years of 2020 and 2021. So um, there are a, a lot of trends which are uh, necessary uh, to adjust our uh, therapy. And a, a lot of trends are also happening in terms of how uh, we are actually um, changing the therapy. And so, again, our data was analyzed in particularly on the question, uh, are there differences in those groups uh, who are uh, using injection therapy only, injection plus sensors, only the pump or the combination of pump and sensor? And you can see that uh, the groups are, are pretty large. Uh, there were around 9,600 uh, children having uh, injection only, uh, close to 4,000 having the combination of uh, injection and a sensor. Uh, again, a little bit more than 4,000 having only a pump and close to 8,000 combining a pump and the sensor. So the first finding here was that the A1C was lower in all categories of participants who used a pump and or a sensor compared to the injection therapy. So uh, clearly having uh, injections um, appears to be less flexible and uh, more difficult to achieve good control uh, than um, those who are using the pumps uh, or in particularly a sensor. And combining this with other studies, if the question is what is more important, is it the pump or is it the sensor? It, it looks very much that the sensor is uh, really uh, the important um, uh, part here. Um, you might be a little bit surprised if you look at the severe hypoglycemia rate here, um, which was lower in the pump no sensor group, but higher in the uh, injection and sensor group. But the reason here we, we have to uh, understand that very often having a severe hypoglycemia was the reason of putting somebody on a, um, on a uh, sensor with an injection therapy. And so, as we know that the risk for severe hypoglycemia is about four years higher after an event of severe hypoglycemia, it is very likely that this is the cause why uh, the severe hypoglycemia was particularly high in this group. So it was not due to the sensor, but the, the sensor was really the reason for putting somebody with injection therapy on a sensor. Interestingly, also the other acute complication, uh, DKA, again, was significantly lower in the pump and sensor group. Uh, you, you would uh, uh, say that uh, a pump in general uh, should have a higher DKA rate, but both groups with a pump had a lower DKA rate than the injection uh, groups. So the idea of that pumps are a particular problem with infusion set failure appears to be less of an issue uh, compared to the more constant insulin delivery that you're having with the pump compared to an injection therapy where missed uh, insulin doses are a frequent occurrence. 
Another important part here is uh, looking at the targets, the treatment targets in different is concerned about having not enough uh, manpower uh, to treat uh, children with diabetes. There is a little bit uh, um, consolation here maybe that we didn't find any association between education time in A1C or uh, the full time equivalent of personnel in HB1C. But what really was uh, very um, outstanding here is that there was a positive association with the target value for uh, glycemic control and A1C outcomes. So more ambitious targets were associated with better outcomes. And uh, that really the composition of diabetes teams could uh, uh, and metabolic control could not be demonstrated. So even with a small team having ambitious targets will lead to good uh, outcomes and good results. Now, uh, what is the next step? We, well, we will now try to uh, get more in touch with the patients. And uh, we have created a patient advisory board, and I'm very, help, uh, uh, very happy that we have also uh, somebody from India joining this board and trying to uh, look at patient-related uh, outcomes um, to see how the, uh, the feeling of the patients, how the satisfaction with diabetes treatment is, um, and relate this uh, to the long-term uh, treatment here. And uh, also, if we look on the political scale here, uh, registries like the Sweet Registry are more and more understood and uh, hopefully long in the long term supported for sustainability uh, because people understand how important registries are, as you can see in this uh, recent uh, publication of the WHO uh, from the European region. So uh, I hope uh, this was interesting for you to see a couple of the new trends uh, coming from the Sweet Registry. And I think one of the nicest things uh, uh, lately was that between 2021, the COVID uh, general meeting of the uh, Sweet Registry, and very recently in April, April uh, the first meeting again, person to person, face to face, uh, during the ATDD meeting in Barcelona in April of 2021. And you see a lot of smiling faces here. And uh, along those lines, I hope very much to see all of you in person uh, in India uh, sometime in the future. And I wish you all the best and thank you again for your attention. Dr. Dan, it was a fantastic, out of the box, unthought uh, presentation. And COVID gave us a challenge and now COVID is giving us an opportunity to do such work. Thank you so much, sir. Now we proceed to the next. Yes, sir. Next speaker is Dr. Minal Mohit, ma'am. Rx team. Dr. So, Minal Mohit, she is a <coughs> consultant and head of Department of Endocrine Manipal Hospital, Jaipur. And she is running thyroid clinic also, and she has a publication in national and international journals. Ma'am, we welcome you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. And thank you, Dr. Bansi, sir, for uh, remembering me and bringing me on this platform. I am talking from Jaipur. It's a virtual meet. I have taken the opportunity to talk to you all on a virtual platform. Uh, if you allow, let me share my screen. So the topic that has been assigned to me talking after Dr. Dane before I proceed. Uh, Dr. Dane, it was a pleasure hearing you all over again. I just chaired your session on almost the same topic in DTCon, if you remember. So after you, I'll be talking on adjunctive therapies in type 1 diabetes. So very good afternoon, all of you. So the very first question that comes to our mind is that when insulin is doing so good and most of the children are well controlled, or at least they are attempting to control sugar as well with insulin, why do we need an adjunctive therapy? So adjunctive therapy is actually needed because there are a lot of glycemic variabilities, there are hypoglycemias, and insulin, we all know, ultimately leads to weight gain. So most of our children or the population with type 1 is put at the risk of micro and macrovascular complication. And though insulin is effective in lowering the blood glucose, 
we need to control something beyond blood glucose in our type 1 diabetic population. So we need something more than insulin that can adjunct insulin that can help insulin in controlling type 1 diabetes. So the message should be very clear that we need a more stable glucose with less hypoglycemia, less weight gain, less complications. So the idea of adjunctive therapy is not to replace insulin, but to help insulin, complement insulin. The idea is not at all to decrease the dose also. The idea is absolutely that to have a better glycemic control and a better metabolic control in type 1 children. So with that concept very clear in mind, what we uh, think about first is a pramiltonide. Pramilinotide is an injectable amyelin analog. Amyelin is another hormone which is secreted from the islet cells of the pancreas. Amyelin is not available in India with us. It is not available in Europe, but it is used in the US. The mechanism of action is that it delays gastric emptying and cre creates a sense of fullness or it improves satiety. So along with insulin, it helps in lowering of HbA1c. Because it delays gastric emptying, it also causes weight loss. But the side effect or the cons of the molecule are that it needs three injections per day. It might add to hypoglycemia and it has significant GI side effects. There have been certain studies with pramilinitide and it has shown to reduce HbA1c but associated with significant GI side effects in terms of nausea, vomiting, anorexia and hypoglycemia. Another action therapy that we all have been using in India also is metformin. Met there have been a lot of studies with metformin, in, especially in children who are very feeling a lot of appetite is there and who are always hungry or maybe who gain a lot of weight with type 1 diabetes and insulin. We do add metformin. So metformin is one of the adjunct therapies that is being prescribed in type 1 children. And there have been trials that is one of the removal trials where we have a data of one year, two years, and up to three years. And all have shown that there was a, a significant reduction in HbA1c. And also there was some reduction in weight. Though the progression to atherosclerosis was not significantly reduced, but we could prevent other cardiovascular risk factors where body weight itself is one of the prime factors which is responsible for the cardiovascular risk factors. Then various other molecules which we are rampantly using in type 2 are now being tried and prescribed in type 1 as an adjunctive therapy. One of them being the GLP-1 RAs. The GLP-1 RA that is Victoza by the brand name or the liraglutide which helps in weight loss. It is being prescribed along with insulin in type 1 children. It helps in the reduction of HbA1c, though not significant, but yes, it does help, but it is also at the same time associated with GI side effects. Lyra is also associated with increased risk of hypoglycemia, and there have been reported cases of diabetic ketoacidosis. The idea that the molecule has never been put up for the FDA approval because of the significant GI side effects. So the research was stopped and the molecule was not put up for the FD approval at all for type 1 children. But there is a very important one of the studies that is adjunct 1 study, which was carried out with one arm being on Lira plus insulin and another arm being on placebo. And it was found that as the Lira dose was increased up to 1.8 milligram, there was HbA1c reduction, which was quite commendable within a period of say 12 weeks and up to the 24 weeks also, that is six month study, it has shown that the HbA1c reduction was significant and that gain in HbA1c reduction was well maintained over the period of one year. Then the newer molecule, that is the SGLT molecule, that is the sodium glucose link transporters one and two, SGLT1 are the molecules which are working at the GI level and they help in the glucose absorption at the intestines. So if we try and inhibit the SGLT1 or we stop SGLT1, we can prevent glucose absorption right in the food itself from the stomach, GI itself, the intestinal level itself. At the same time, SGLT2, which is responsible for the reabsorption of the filtered glucose. If we can inhibit SGLT2, we can cause glucose urea and help HB, reduction of HbA1c, 
or we can help as adjunctive therapy in type 1 diabetes management. So with this concept, we are now trying out with molecules like sotagliflozin, which is a dual SDLT1 and SDLT2 inhibitor. So with SDLT2 inhibitor here, if you see, we can block this and we can increase glucoseuria and HbA1c or the blood glucose levels can be brought down. If we have a dual blocker which blocks both SGLT1 at the intestinal levels and SGLT2 at the kidney levels, we can cause a dual SGLT2 blockade and prevent glucose absorption on one hand and prevent glucose reabsorption on the other hand. So SGLT2 and SGLT1, both molecules if inhibited, will also help in 100% reabsorption prevention from the renal level also. Because though 90% of the glucose is reabsorbed in the PCT by SGLT2, we also have some 10% reabsorption in the loop of Henle by SGLT1. So these dual blockers will not only prevent glucose absorption from GI, but also cause 100% prevention of reabsorption at the kidney level, causing glucose urea. So dual blockers SGLT2 and SGLT1 are one of the important class of adjunctive therapy and they have been used in type 1 children. They also cause weight loss and they do not have any GI side effects. They have insulin independent mechanism of working. Sotagliflozin, as I was talking, is a novel dual GLT, SGLT1 and 2 inhibitor. So the studies that have been conducted with SGLT1 and 2 combined, that is a dual blockade, is that in tandem studies in tandem is a series of studies where in tandem 1 and 2 had almost a similar pattern where we had three arms and it was one year study. It was one arm was treated with 200 milligrams of sotagliflozin, another arm was 400 milligrams and the third was a placebo controlled arm. And in similar pattern was followed in in tandem 2. In tandem 3 series, we had a larger number of patients. It was a six month study. And there was no 200 milligram arm. It was only a placebo compared with a 400 milligram uh, dosing. The only problem with our SGLT2 and SGLT1 and the dual blockade was that though we had as a primary endpoint a reduction in HbA1c, as a secondary endpoint, it was found that from the baseline, the HbA1c reduction was significant, but also there was increased chances of euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, which was reported. So it was found that we are still uh, inhibited from using this molecule very frequently, though this molecule does give us good results in terms of adjunctive control of blood glucose along with insulin. The word along with insulin is very, very important because we missed using insulin and we missed feeding the children with the basic minimum of carbohydrates and that led to euglycemic ketoacidosis, which was mainly responsible for euglycemic ketoacidosis in patients who were treated with SGLT2 or SGLT1 and 2 combined, that is a dual blockade. So in tandem 3 series, again, it was found that there was a significant weight loss. There was a, a drop in the systolic blood pressure, as well as there was a reduction in HbA1c, but there were some chances of euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. In tandem 3 series, the hypo episodes were almost comparable in the as compared to placebo that we all know even in type 2, the experience, the learning from type 2, that the incidence of hypo with the SGLT2 inhibitors are not significant. Similarly, in the in tandem 3 series, hypo episodes and the DKS episodes, as you see, were not very significant or not very far from the placebo control arm if we are cautious and we are following the standard protocol. So what are the protocols I will tell you when you are working with SGLT2 or SGLT2 and one dual blockade in type 1 children? Now, this is another study that is the DEPICT1 and DEPICT2 studies, which were carried out with dapagliflozin. The similar pattern with after our initial run-in period, screening period, they were randomized in 1 is to 1 is to 1 series with dapagliflozin 5 milligram to 10 milligram to placebo. And in all the three arms, insulin was always there. So insulin was not taken off. And as compared to placebo, there was a significant reduction in HbA1c. The reduction was more, of course, as very well understood with definitely close in 10 milligrams compared to 5 milligrams. But even 5 milligrams gave us a significant HbA1c reduction as compared to the placebo arm. So 
So DEPIC 2 has also shown the secondary endpoint, that is the mean change in HbA1c was also very significant. So DEPIC 2 has also given us the data from time and range. As we know now, the latest figures, as even Dr. Den was talking, we are also considering the combined approach of HbA1c as well as the time spent in range. So DEPIC-2 trial also took into consideration the time in range, and it was found that the patients who were in the Dep uh, closed arm had significantly improved control and more time was spent in range as compared to the placebo arm. Then there was empagliflozin studies, that is the EASE trial, empagliflozin as adjunctive to insulin therapy in type 1 children. Again, it's a phase 3 trial. It has shown the EASE-1 series, EASE-1, EASE-2, and EASE-3, taking into consideration 5, 10, and 25. Again, the data has almost been similar that SGLT2 inhibitors in general give us good adjunctive role in type 1 children along with insulin in controlling HbA1c, in weight reduction, and also increasing the time spent in range. So the time spent in range with 5, 10, and 25 was by increased by 1 hour, 3 hours almost every day as compared to the placebo arm. Now the SGLT2 inhibitors, but they have their side effects and they come with their own set of challenges. Not only the DKA, that is the euglycemic DKA, but also the common complications that we are facing in type two population also, that is the increased incidence of genitourinary infections. So the increased incidence of genitourinary infection was very common in this group also. So we need to increase the fluid intake at the same time. There was an initial decrease in GFR by almost 5 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square of the body surface area. But this decreased GFR improved later on with the continuous use, showing that it was just the intraglomerular hemodynamic alteration and not actually the molecule which is affecting the renal functioning. Similarly, the credence trial, which was done with canagliflozin, gave us that these are actually the nephroprotective molecules. So the initial fall in GFR is not because of any side effects or any worsening of the kidney functioning, but it was just because of the intraglomerular hemodynamic alterations. But the genital infections, yes, like candidiasis is very common. So we need to take care. And at the very initial first complaint, we withdraw the molecule and treat the infection rather than allowing the infection to increase. So the safety issues, again, the genital infection, euglycemic DKA, and hypoglycemias. Severe hypos with SGLT2s are SGLT2 inhibitors or SGLT1 and 2 dual inhibitors has been rarely reported. And so hypo is not a very big concern, but more important concerns are genital infections and the euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. So when you are suspecting a diabetic ketoacidosis, that is a population on SGLT inhibitors, you must tell your ER staff, your ER, the emergency staff or your JRs or your nursing staff should be well informed that there is an entity when the sugars might be normal, but still the ketones are present and ketones can be large. So these are the conditions that the patient can be on SGLT inhibitors. So these are the conditions and the immediate action that needs to be taken is start the patient on insulin, start the patient on fluids and give some 30 grams of carbohydrate. So in one of the smaller studies, it was found that type 1 diabetic patients treated actually with uh, SGLT2 eyes, they need insulin always. And it is not the basal insulin which is mainly responsible, but it is the prandial insulin which was interrupted and that was responsible for as, uh, DK, that is euglycemic DK with SGLT2 inhibitors. So how do we manage it? Managing, as I told you, start on insulin, start on carbs, that is glucose, and maintain the blood sugars, start the IV fluids, withdraw the SGLT. There's one standard protocol, the stitch protocol. So that is how we manage when the patient presents to you with type 1 diabetes and diabetic ketoacidosis and so euglycemic ketoacidosis. Start carbohydrates, stay hydrated, start insulin. Though you might require very low doses of insulin, but insulin, especially the regular insulin or the prandial insulin is something that is really required. So the stitch protocol, as I was saying, first is stitch, that is stop SGLT, I, that is in, start insulin, C, start carbohydrates, 
and H is for hydrate. So stitch protocol, you must follow in all euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. Also, all patients with type 1 on SGLT2 should always carry a card with them that I'm on SGLT2. So if I'm found with ketoacidosis and normal sugars, please start me with IV fluids, insulin, and carbohydrates and stop the SGLT inhibitors. So these are the considerations when we are talking of euglycemic ketoacidosis in adjunct therapies. Other things like DK rise is seen especially in women because maybe the women are more prone to low-carb diets, though it is becoming more common in men as well. People who are fasting should withdraw SGLT2 inhibitors. So fasting, though we do not recommend fasting in type 1 children, but still, if the children are falling fast because of some religious reasons or because of some emergencies, medical emergencies, then SGLT2 inhibitors or SGLT1 and 2 dual inhibitors should be withdrawn. And you must always educate your staff, the diabetic uh, patient, the ER staff, the emergency staff, your JRs, SRs, whosoever are managing your patients with diabetes, especially type 1, should be well informed about this entity. Then coming to the management of CV risk in type 1, Though the CV risk does not come across, we do not encounter for the first five years. But after five years, we set that same pattern of follow-up, same pattern of screening. And the patients of type 1 are definitely at higher risk of cardiovascular uh, mortality and morbidity. And this CV risk has been shown in tandem series as well as in E series. And we have to screen them to manage them. And management is just the same. For dyslipidemia, we add statins. A regular lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle, diet, carb intake should be restricted and a regular exercise regime should be followed. Now these newer molecules, the LIDA trial and the EMPAREC trial has given us that these molecules have CV benefits. So these molecules can be used in type 1 children also. On a very sad note, we have come across this data from the Swedish study, the Swedish uh, data registry, that children almost lose 17.7 life years and children lose almost 15 life years once they are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So the CV risk is very high and these molecules, newer molecules have shown CV benefit as well as renal benefits in various studies. So we must give that benefit, extend that benefit to our population with type 1. So what are the patient experience? The patient feedback is very positive because it's a tablet, first of all, and patients are finding it good to have something which is not injectable, a tablet which is bringing down their insulin dose, a tablet which is helping them to control their blood glucose. In spite of the urogenital mycosis, patients are willing to accept it, though we need to counsel against this concept, but the patient feedback is positive because significantly because it's a tablet and significantly because it's giving them a good glycemic control. So the patient experience is positive and we are using these molecules off-label also because they are still not recommended to be used in type 1 as adjunctive therapy, but they are being used in type 1 and especially uh, a little older children. The newer agents which are being used as adjunct therapies even DPP-4 inhibitors, though they have not shown any benefit in terms of in terms of HPA1C reduction and in terms of hypoglycemia. GLP-1 RA, they never filed for FDA. Maybe now with the launch of SEMA, they might try that. I'm not sure of that actually. But they have not tried for FDA so far. SGLT1 and 2, that is the dual blockade, the sotagliflozin or the SGLT2 inhibitor, that is the DAPA, MPA, CANA, they are being tried and they are currently being researched further for being used in type 1 children as adjunct to insulin therapies. So just to summarize my presentation, we are presently working only with insulin for the management of type 1 diabetes in children. We have various modes of insulin delivery in terms of pens or continuous subcutaneous insulin infusions. We have various scientific advancements in terms of CGMS, flash monitoring, or the Libre or the Libre Pro. But we are still facing the challenge of hypoglycemia, weight gain, and glucose variability, which is causing a high rise of cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. And we have micro and macrovascular complications in type 1 children very soon by the time they are attaining their most prime years of life, that is their adulthood. So we are looking for adjunct therapies. 
and these adjunct therapies are a huge pipeline so we have the non insulin based we have the injectables we have the non injectables we have immunomodulator based and a lot of series the cytokine mediator inhibitor there are a lot of series of molecules which are all in the research phase as of now but the idea of all adjunct therapies is to control the quality that is the quality of life years along with good glycemic control with no weight gain no hypoglycemia and no side effects that is being evaluated so the right balance that we need to find between the metabolic improvement and the quality of life without increasing the chances of diabetic ketoacidosis or weight gain or hypoglycemia or the glycemic variability it's a dream come true or an ideal mode of management for the type 1 children probably and we'll soon have it i'm sure so with that note hoping for a better future for all our type 1 children and with that note closing this talk and handing it over back to the organizer thank you once again for inviting me here dr bansi sir and the entire diabetes india team thank you so much dr minal thanks a lot for your presentation and it has given a different uh, concept and I, i hope that along with this there should have been some focus on a lifestyle which is working quite differently anyway <laughs> Uh, that's a separate topic by itself so i hand over uh, uh, the, the presentation to the organizers and thank all three presenters for one of the best presentation thank you thank you sir thank you so much thank you meenal ma'am thank you deepak sir uh, meenal ma'am if you permit uh, can i ask something Sure, Dhruvi. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure, Dhruvi. Ma'am, the honor is all mine. Uh, Ma'am, in real world, you know, I, I still feel skeptical as to starting uh, OHAs or even SJT two for that matter. Uh, we all know we are writing insulin, but there are people who Google up things like you know, कि हम ये दवाई ले सकते हैं. the guidelines are saying ye dawai le sakte hai so how comfortable in real world are we as doctors or can you uh, you know maybe give your opinion about how often have you prescribed all of these oids yeah truvi thank you for this question because i can answer it very confidently i have many of my patients metformin frequently we are adding to most of my type 1 because these are children and they are keep eating every minute okay and they are putting on weight and they are hogging like anything so to control appetite metformin has been used since many many years but now we are also using sgld2 inhibitors very frequently and many of my type 1 patients though they are little older ones maybe above 18 also so they are on sgld2 inhibitors also very frequently with a caution that yes increase of fluid intake maintain your hygiene Mm-hmm. so and at the very first earliest sign of uh, thrush or any itching or any redness just do report genital infections do report back so these are the molecules even pyoglitazone on i have used in some of my type 1 children as insulin sensitizers and I also where i find that the sugars are really the doses of insulin are really going very very high mm-hmm. and in all of my patients the reports have been very positive all the parents have come back saying that after the addition of metformin the appetite has been well controlled that food habits have been regularized and also the sugars have been well controlled and the, the glycemic variability has really dropped similarly we have added even uh, uh, liraglutide though i have not added sema to any of my type 1 so far but we have added liraglutide we have added these glucosins very frequently Mm-hmm. so yes i do have a data of type 1 patients not i will say type 1 children actually but mm-hmm. type 1 patients yes i have many who are on oha and interestingly you are very right when i say i will be adding one tablet to your insulin they also give me the same shock and ex- expression tablet for type 1 yeah they work don't worry and they will work well so yes we do have a data and we do have patients of type 1 who are on ohs along with insulin nowhere we have withdrawn insulin so the basal and prandial insulin with whatever combinations and plus ohs for the adjunctive benefit we have been using thank you so much ma'am thank you uh, 
Deepak sir, would you like to add uh, a few words about lifestyle mm-hmm. modification in type one diabetes? For uh, I, I, I think uh, we'll close because we'll be then running short of the time. But some other time. Uh, thank yeah. you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just take this opportunity to say good afternoon to Dr. Parikh sir because I can see him here, sir. Yes, yes, sir. yes. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, sir. Abhi hai lecture ya limit kya? सर डिस्कशन इफ परिक सर और दीपक सर और मीनल मैम वुड लाइक टू यू नो एड ऑन समथिंग टू दी टाइप वन सिम्पोजियम डॉक्टर मनोज चावला इज ज्वाइन लेट अस हैव हिज कमेंट्स Good afternoon, Manoj sir. Good afternoon, Manoj sir. Do you have any comments, please? As because we have time, Dhruvi. Interestingly, the uh, listing or the drug list is huge. If you talk of adjunctive therapy or the newer, actually the topic was adjunctive therapy. Yes. If we talk of the newer frontiers or the drugs on the horizon, was which are still not out in the market, but there is a huge list, right from the molecular. तेरे बरोसे तो तेरे बरोसे तो right from the molecular level i talk like from the cell mediated immunity to the t cell immunity the immunomodulators and there is a huge list of molecules which are still in the pipeline which are if really whenever the they will be with us to practice it might change the entire scenario of type 1 diabetes management and hopefully we see a very bright future maybe we can prevent all the complications and we can give the entire life span to our children looks very very promising ma'am and uh, you know we all know that all of these adjunctive therapies are along with insulin so yeah. i think it is uh, very important that it comes from you that you said it very specifically ke huh. insulin band mat karo you have to started with uh, insulin yeah insulin because basically all these children are pra- insulinopenic children so we need insulin in any case for the basic metabolism for the carbohydrate metabolism and the basic metabolism to stay on carbohydrate metabolism the minimum amount of carbs is required for the basic enzymatic activities also even for the thyroid functioning we require some carbohydrate we can't just say stop carbs totally we can't go for real very low carb diet always especially in children so we need some 50% of the total calorie intake in form of carbohydrates and we for that carb metabolism we all need insulin so insulin can never be stopped or replaced but yes insulin can also be assisted in terms of all these molecules till we don't have a proper transplant maybe functional where we can have the beta cells and we can have the endogenous insulin production <laughs> Ma'am, the simple answer is insulin can be sensitized and empowered, but not replaced. Yes. Simple. Right, sir. Hmm. Very rightly yeah. said, Deepak sir. Uh, yeah. Ma'am, we have one question in the chat box from Dr. Arun Kedia, sir. He is asking you if you have any experience with AGIs and type one. We have some experience with AGI. AGI, yes. yes. AGI is another molecule which is approved, sir, and which is being used. Very correct. AGI is just like uh, metformin. they are the molecules which like the vogli boss or a car boss we are using them just to give them patient a sense of satiety delaying gastric emptying and stopping the food craving so they are also being used and recommended and approved for type 1 adjunct therapy again so there was another word in the chat box about the biological molecules so biologicals are also on the horizon very soon we might have them in the market for use they are still not approved or in the market but as i told you there is a huge list i actually did not bring that list otherwise there is a huge list of biologicals also which are on the horizon which are being worked upon with thank you so much ma'am um any any comments from uh, deepak sir and one last maybe closing remark from meenal ma'am and deepak sir and uh, we can close this session i think no comments we can close the session
thank you deepak sir meena ma'am any closing remarks and uh, we have the next two speakers I so i want selvan uh, dhruvi the most important remark that i would requ- like as a team we should work is that we do lose them very frequently for follow ups we see them after they are lost for one year or so and then they come suddenly with very high hpa1c so education is yeah. most important yeah. for the patient level and at the parent level then the alternative therapies need to be explained that they will not work in type 1 children insulin is the only treatment everything else comes as adjunctive regular follow up even making them aware for complications because just like type 2 they will also end up with retinopathies nephropathies neuropathies and all macrovascular complications and at a younger age when not expected by the general population so the macrovascular complications like the mi can happen at a very younger age in type 1 children where the type 2 will not be even expecting it or the young adults will not be expecting it so patient education becomes the most important part of type 1 children and the management a good glycemic control and a regular follow up thank you so much meenal ma'am thank you for taking you know the leadership and uh, the type 1 symposium indeed was very very interactive because you made it so so interesting and to discuss about thank you so much ma'am um uh, dhruvi with, thank you deepak thank sir you, and thank you dr bansi once again it was really nice being here i wish i would have been in goa and with you all but i'm so sorry thank you so much <laughs>